Hello and welcome to the Survival to Triumph show. This is episode six. I'm Laura Hill from Swansea in Wales in the UK. And my guest this evening is Kenny Granville, all the way from the USA. I do believe he's from Texas. Am I right, Kenny? That's correct. El Paso, Texas. There we are. Lovely. So Kenny's going to tell us his journey of Survival to Triumph. So over to you, Kenny. Leave it over to you. Well, first and foremost, I just got to say thank you for uh, allowing me your platform. This is an amazing opportunity that, you know, uh, I never thought I'd have an opportunity to speak about my story in so many different ways, but it's always nice to share the, the, the ability to get over the things that people currently are going through now where they think they're not going to be able to make it through and they're not going to be able to overcome just to be an example that with, you know, the patience that you have and you have no choice but to have eventually it will all be in your past and you know utilizing those those opportunities to become better and those opportunities as a reflection of what you can do it's kind of where led me to where i am today brilliant absolutely and that's the you know basically the ethos of this show is to show anybody anybody and everyone that no matter what you go through in life there is something that can be done you can get help and you can get through the other side and you can come out on top. So I understand um, from what you told me before is that you were in the military. So right. if you want to take us on the journey from that. Sure. I joined the Air Force in 2000, of June of 2000, maybe like a week or two after I graduated from high school. And a lot of it was um, a little bit unorthodox for my family. My, my father was in the Army. My older sister joined the Army shortly after I joined the Air Force. And so for me to be the only Air Force One kind of stepped out of that uh, format. But, you know, it was definitely something that my parents supported. Um, but looking back, it was also something that uh, we wish we had waited on because that honestly was the start of the things to come, so to speak. But it, it accelerated a lot of things that I wasn't able to really grasp. I joined the military as a child. Not only did I join at 17, I turned 18 right towards the end of basic training, but mentally I wasn't ready for anything that was offered to me. The, the military was an escape and I used it to really run away and, and all the freedom that I was felt I didn't have at home from my parents being parents and from the things that just weren't accessible to me at that time now realizing that if I had just worked a little bit harder, I could have had all the things that I wanted, but I thought it was a quick way to gain my freedom, gain money, have employment. Um, this was before they had raised the age limit for medical in the military in the United States to 25 for your parents to cover you. So I was afraid that I was going to turn 18 and I didn't have that security of the military health insurance. So there was a lot of things that I thought joining the military was going to fix, but it just ended up putting me in a situation to where I was able to um, survive. A lot of it was just off of just natural skills and talents that I wasn't able to exploit for my, my betterment. But in the end, it just wasn't enough. And it started to be a snowball of, of issues to come. Uh, I would say maybe a year and a half into me joining, September 11th happened. And mm -hmm that was an eye-opening experience because up until that time, everything we were doing in the military was training exercises. And it was just that this is what we will do in that time of war. But now that it became an active thing, everything that we were training for is now reality. To include how the entire nation changed as far as how we were talking to each other, how we were engaging one another, you really saw a, a height in hatred rise for people of Middle Eastern descent. And no matter if they were from the States or not, they were the enemy. And then that kind of filtered the rest of the hatred from those who already had that mentality to kind of continue and to step up and to be on the forefront. And for me as an 18, oh, at the time I was 19, um, to experience all of this when my upbringing had nothing to do with any of these things. It was a real culture shock. So dealing with that within two years of joining the military and then experiencing all of the negativity that comes with it, you know, um, the, the different cultures of people that you're in, the, the melting pot of the, what the military is of all the different people getting caught up in the wrong crowd, um, 
receiving uh, punishment. I mean, not even a year in the military, losing all of my rank, my money, kind of starting at the bottom and then trying to get my way to the top. And by the time I ended up getting medically discharged, I had achieved a level of recognition for the position I was working in, for the, um, for the job that I was doing and for the things that I had done. But by that time, it was already too late. That was when my mental illness really took over to the point that it was affecting my body and shutting down and eventually led to me getting out of the service um, a little less than eight years from the time I joined. Wow, gosh, that's so much information there. So let me pick this apart a bit. So first of all, the first interesting um, thing I wanted to pick out on, because those of us in the UK, we have the National Health Service. So we often forget that in America, you've got to, if you want health insurance, you've got to pay for that. You don't get it free. So that was part of you, the part of the attraction of going in the military at a certain age to be able to get, you know, reassurance that if you were ill, you get some support. It was, you know, when you say reassurance, it was more just, it was a bonus of me getting out the house. Yeah. And it was the only life I knew. Like my dad practically was in the military my entire life. So to not have that security, it just made sense to me that why not go here and it's gonna continue what you're, I don't have to change or work towards something that was already for free for me. Yeah, it's definitely a benefit. And I think a lot of young people, even over here, they, you know, they join up 16, 17 and it's just children really, isn't it? It's young, it's young people. It's, it's, I bet you had to grow up a lot in that time, Kenny. It wasn't like, that I, I had to, I was just, I was just a child trying to get, trying to deal with adult situations and a, a lot of um, decisions that should have been made with an educated mind. I lacked that education. And it was one of those things where experience would have taught me that something a book couldn't, but because of my, my activity, my, my childish manner, you know, my immature mind, none of that was going to happen. Yeah, okay. And you mentioned mental illness. So are you able to share what mental illness that was with our viewers? Yeah. So at the time, it was what they called, uh, I was having pseudo seizures, where I was having the symptoms of a, a seizure to where I would convulse, I would black out, I would pass out, but I didn't have the, um, the messy side of it where I, I would release my bowels and I would defecate on myself and urinate on myself. But what was happening was I was vomiting blood. So I would, almost every single time I would pop a blood vessel. So my eyes were always looking like they were literally bloodshot. Um, I would always wake up in the hospital with them pumping my stomach because anytime you vomit blood, the, um, the understanding is there's blood in your bowels or somewhere where they need to pump it. And I would just go through these physical ailments and I would be drained. I would be physically in pain and I drained and I wouldn't remember anything, but I would remember the precursor and the feeling that would build up to it. It was like a, a caterpillar crawling up the back of my neck, almost like that, that paralyzing, shocking feeling. And it was when moments of high stress would kick in and I couldn't escape. Like I literally couldn't run away from it. And my body was like, okay, we're done you know, hit the light switch. And every single time I'd wake up, blood on me, blood on the floor, people panicking, or I'd be in the hospital already, or I'd be on my way um, in an ambulance. This is this happened in front of my commander, my first sergeant, my supervisors. Um, it happened in front of my parents, you know, my uh, fiance at the time. So it happened enough time that the military, at first they were like, you know, he's going to the extremes to fake it. But wow. who wants to fake vomit? How do you fake vomiting blood? How do you I don't know. pop an eye whistle? You know, it's... My gosh. That is terrifying, Kenny. You know, for you and everyone around you, really, to find you in that condition as well. So they medically discharged you. Mm -hmm. How did that make you feel after eight years of service? Well, I, I was on a, uh, a medical a medical leave where I had like two years to where they would evaluate me. And then after that evaluation, either I would be fully discharged from the military or they would sign me back up in to continue my service. And after a while, it was really weird. You know, this was during a time where the VA, the Veterans um, Affairs wasn't the best. They weren't nowhere where they are now. So a lot of it was just 
writing off, you know, let's try this medication to see if this works. And I went from, and, uh, I went from antidepressants to anxiety medication, to seizure medication, to um, what I ended up on was uh, bipolar medication. Okay. And it just does such a damage to your body because with that comes hypertension, high blood pressure. And with that is a bottle or two different kinds of medications. So at the time I was a walking pharmacy. You know, I, I had all of these different things. And when I would go see my psychiatrist and my therapist, there wasn't an answer to what was going on with me. It was, yeah, you're feeling it, you're sick, you're good to go. And they would write you off. And at the time I didn't have a consistent support system, meaning I didn't have a regular therapist. I didn't have a regular psychiatrist. They would revolve, they would move on, they would pass on. So it was always having to talk about the same things. Hmm. And when I would start to get somewhere, I would go see somebody else. Yeah. I can understand you keep telling your story again and again, and that's really frustrating. So the bipolar medication then, even though, like you said, you were taking different medications, was it helping at all? Did it help with those seizures? Uh, you know, um, after I will say this, the bipolar, we didn't figure that out until literally 10 years later. At that time, when I, the, 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 from the time I got out to military till the time, and this is a, a key important timeline that I always remember is when I actually moved back to Texas from, and this all happened when I was in Alaska, um, I didn't take my medication, but then I was living, I was compensating and coping with what life offered me. And this is kind of what led me to eventually be homeless because I wasn't tending to my, my, um, my mental illness or my mental health. I was indulging in the nightlife because I became a DJ and I was working at the bar. And then, you know, with that nightlife comes all of the, the things that are attached to it, the drinking, the nighttime drugs, the, the partying, the staying up late, becoming an insomniac. And then being an insomniac in a place like Alaska where sometimes in a year it's majority dark and then it's always light. So you, there's a small window of having a regular cycle of time. So you literally lose track of time while you're there. And then I, I started to build a, a group of friends that were awesome people. They were great. And the culture in Alaska is like, you know, if you're in the in crowd, you're, you're, you're good to go. If you get a good set of friends, they're going to be there for you. Plus the people that I was in the military with that came out, that was my mentors. And they all saw that potential that I had to be better. But what I saw was the opportunity to coast through life where I didn't have to work to where I had that payment from the, the VA that was taking care of my day to day. I can work enough at this bar job to, to pay for the extra bills. And then I can live that coast life of doing what I want. And the, the reason why I joined the military now was coming to fruition, but it was coming with a cost. It was coming at a price. And that was my health, my relationships. It was all just coming to a boiling pot. And, and I lit that fuse. And after a while, by the time it blew up, it wasn't just an explosion that affected me. I mean, it blew my entire life apart. I can imagine. And I think part of you going through all the partying as well is probably from what you went through in the military, in the Air Force. Uh, you know, it's like having a release when you live in such a disciplined environment and you know when everything, you've got to go get up really early and everything. It's kind of like, almost like I'm free and it's all this partying and life is really fun and it's like you just live in that moment like you only live once but then like you say it does take a toll on your health mm. you know and I, I've been there I lived abroad and I was a holiday rep overseas and, and I know I was binge drinking and stuff and it was brilliant at the time but it did take a toll on my body afterwards right. and anybody who's done that kind of thing can can understand that as well so when you were partying, you didn't have the bipolar diagnosis then, it came sort of afterwards, after the unravel. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and it really came when after I was able to find a way to um, communicate what exactly I was feeling, because I had to be honest with myself, first of all. And, that, and that's one of the biggest things that I was doing. I was running away from a lot of truths. You know, I was mm -hmm. running away from the fact that I needed help. I was running away from the fact that I didn't want to face my responsibilities. You know, I, at the time I was a father of two children. My parents were already helping taking care of my first child. And then my second child, I was actively taken care of, but you know, between the, um, 
her mom and my situation, like it was, it was horrible. You know, it wasn't nowhere near as good. And eventually I had to make the choice, you know, to, to leave my daughter in Alaska, not because I wanted to, but I had to, like, I was in an environment to where you know, I was just self-destructing. If I didn't leave, I was going to die. There was no doubt about that. I would have died there. I would have been another statistic. I would have been a, another person found on the street. I would have easily OD'd on the, the nightlife, the party, and I would have been caught up in the situation where somebody else would have took my life, and I wasn't doing anything good for myself. And I, I remember that day too, like the precursor to all of that was, you know, I, I had just, um, just lost uh, my car. I, I pulled out of a pulled out of a, a liquor store. And I forgot to turn my lights on at night. Cop pulled me over. Kind of find out my license had been suspended. Then. And, from there, I couldn't go to school and I was getting money for school. So that was gone. I couldn't go to my job because it was the other side of town. Um, no one wanted to come pick me up from the side of town I was living on. And I couldn't pay my rent. Eventually, I was kicked out. My daughter's mom was like, you know what? You're no good. You can't take care of our daughter. And when she was with me, when I ended up becoming homeless, she was staying with me at, at, at homeless shelters. And I, I would make sure that when she was with me, we would go to these shelters or I would bank off the kindness of my friends who would let me stay on their couch. And all of my friends are, are single people. They don't want to be around a child, but I would put that on them to like, Hey, let me sleep on your couch. Oh, and by the way, I have a two year old, three year old with me, mm. you know? So like eventually all of that just got to, to be too much. And I was literally in the behind an alley in the dirt, hands and knees crying, just crying my, my eyes out because I was lost. I had nothing else to offer or give. Literally what was my backpack in my pocket was the only thing I, I had. And my only avenue left was to reach out to family. And I knew if I did that, I was owning a lot of things that, that I didn't want to face. Yeah. Wow, this story, it could be made into a film, Kenny. It's... Um... It's insane. So the point where, so your um, ex and your daughter, is it your daughter? Did you say daughter? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So two-year-old daughter, sofa surfing, that's what we call it out here, like sofa surfing. And then at, at that point then, did she, and you both said, so she went her separate way then and she was able to get accommodation? But she, her mom was living a very steady life and her mom's family was there too so you know her aunt uh, uncle grandma they were there for her so she had that but because of the turmoil that we had, we were going through like I didn't want to relinquish that because that would mean the person that was giving me the most grief would be right and yeah. I was at the time a lot of my decisions were based off a false sense of pride you know it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like if you're living in if you're leaving in a filth and you pick and you clean one spot and you want a trophy for it, but then when no one acknowledges this little bit that you've done when the rest of the area is just as messy and as bad, you know, like that's the mentality I had. Like I wanted, I wanted recognition and praise for the bare minimum I was barely doing and I didn't deserve it. Looking back at it, you know, she was right about a lot of things. Yeah. Self-reflection and hindsight is a wonderful thing, isn't it? We can't see it in the moment. So when you were living on the streets then, so how long were you living on the streets and were they with you the whole time or did you sort of branch out on your own then to that point where you were? In? Oh, I, I would say um, it was on and off for about two years, probably a year solid to where I, I, was, I was on the street. And it was mainly when I had lost everything, but I didn't want anybody to know. Right. And I was, I was putting on a front. So I, I knew that, hey, all I got to do is call my parents. They're going to send me, they're going to Western Union me something, you know, especially if I need it for my daughter. I'm like, hey, we need food. Like, I, I, I literally have nothing. Can you help out? You know, um, they would send money for that. I would, if I was able to get in touch with a friend, okay, I knew I had a place to stay and I'm good to go. But then I would abuse that situation too. Like if I had a place to stay, I was trying to party. I was trying to invite somebody over to their house, right? And then eventually I was on the streets 
uh, would say 08, 2008, 2008, 2009. Um, that was where I was 100% on the streets, living in Tent City, altering back between the uh, Brother Francis homeless shelter and living in the woods. Wow. Looking at you, that's just insane, isn't it? And like, I think, you know, we've, we've all done it. We've walked past the homeless person. We've probably given them some money sometimes and then we feel like are they going to spend it on drink or drugs and then you do walk past them in the rain and you feel sad and but then part of you then sometimes we do have our head down and we just walk past and we say you know when they're begging I haven't got any change and often the time we haven't got change but it's like I often think sometimes like what was their story where was where's their family what happened how did it and I think it's so easy to fall into that like you say, you had family, but there's the pride thing. There's, you know, it's a job loss. It's, it's, a, it's a mental illness or mental distress. It's a job loss. There's, you know, you can't make the rent. So it's just like one job loss, one depression, one mental illness. It can happen to anybody, can't it? It can happen to absolutely anyone. When, when your life is based off a very minimal lifestyle, all it takes is for one thing to go wrong for that entire house to crumble. And in my situation, now it wasn't one thing, it was almost everything. You know, so what do you do when you've burned all the bridges and the one bridge you have left is covered with, you know, you have no shoes and to cross that bridge, you have to cross broken glass in the dark with no rails, you know, you, you don't know. And you can't see the bottom of the, of the precipice that you're crossing over. You can't see the other end, but you know what's over there. And you're afraid the entire time. And that's what it was living like. You know, it, it, it was a, there are certain things that I remember specifically and very clearly, but a lot of it was just a fearful haze of, is this my time? Is this it? Am I going to ever have an opportunity to atone for anything I did? But going back to when I was in that alley, hands and knees crying in the dirt is where I saw what I needed to do. You know, it, it was that voice for me, it, it, it was like, it was like God was speaking into me. God was telling me, get up and move forward. Take that step of a thousand steps. Like you have to move forward. You have to get up. And he showed me the way and I saw what I can do and who I could become. And all the voices of everybody that was telling me how much potential I had finally made sense. But the only thing that, that was terrifying me the most is walking through that door, taking that first step. And that was owning a lot of what I did, owning what I was doing, owning what I needed to do and, and, and really being a, a part. And I think that was the first day of the rest of my life as that was my defining moment. Wow, so that's almost like a divine intervention, isn't it? When you, when you, when you picked rock bottom, I'm sure you said this to me before, it might've been someone else, is you, you either go six feet under or, or you start climbing up. Uh, yeah, it was rock, you, rock bottom. Rock bottom is, is, is a perception. It can be the end of the road or it can be the drawing board, right? And we all go to rock bottom. There's no point in our life. Like even now, my problems are just elevated problems of what I had before, but there are they as bad. So whenever I'm doing good in my life now, but then something bad happens to where I feel like it's all over. That's just a modified version of my rock bottom. But then I go back to my drawing board and I reevaluate my life and I'm able to move forward. But it's because I'm able to go through all those experiences that I wish I had when I first went to military and experience all of these traumas that eventually I'm able to look back on with reflection and, and humbleness, right? Mm -hmm. That I can turn around and say, now I can use these lessons to feed my future and to live in the now the right way. You're so brave, Kenny. Your story is like incredible. And, you know, it's the thing we hear of in this country as well, that when, when soldiers and people in you know, the Air Force and Navy, when they leave, when the veterans, when they've been in war, they come out. It's hard to adapt to civilian life, never mind all the trauma and everything. It really affects people. There's a PTSD, which I think you've told me you, you've experienced as well. And they're not getting the mental health support. And then it did, does affect marriages and relationships and then, you know, jobs. And like you say, and, and, and we have in this country got veterans who end up homeless. And it's, you know, they're forgotten by, by the government. They're forgotten by 
the state of the wonderful job they've done and you know and their respective position and you know sadly I know somebody who who took their own life after experiencing PTSD and um you know it, it is a really a really really sad thing but it's amazing how you you've been one of the lucky ones that you've you've had this um bravery and courage to to start your life again and you were able to push through and push past that and that's incredible you know and I'm sure you are but something to be very proud of it's it's not a for me anyway it's not a a matter of being courageous it's a matter of do I want to live better you know that that has nothing to do with courage that's survival you know and and if my survival depends on me being okay, being complacent, and I'm only going to survive. That's a, there's an expiration date on complacency. You know, there's an expiration date on being okay with things that you're not okay with. You know, there is only a certain amount of time that we, I mean, our time on this earth is limited as is, but we control just how much of it we get to enjoy and really truly live. And a lot of times, you know, people don't get to do this until they are at their deathbed, where they have a diagnosis, when they know they're going to, to, to pass. But when you don't know is the scariest thing, but it's also the most enlightening thing about life is you have an opportunity. And if I look back and I made that call after I got out, I dusted myself off and I made the phone call to my parents to say, you know, what, I'm ready to come home. And then stroke of bad luck, I get hit by a car and I, I would have not made it, I at least decided to get out of that spot and I made an active choice to do that. So I chose to live a better life. And yeah. that's my perception of it. But it's now because of all these things that I've went through, like I, what I learned how to do is I learned to cope because I didn't want to take all these medicines that wasn't working. I coped with my talents and my skills. I started painting on the streets with spray paint art. I started to learn how to play music. You know, I really started to develop in my, uh, my spoken word, my poetry, and I was horrible, right? I was the worst at it, but I tried to do it. And looking back then, those were things that I was doing to keep my mind busy, to keep myself from self-destructing. And to the point now, to where there are things that I, these are talents that I share with my children and watch them turn around and use it for themselves. But when they ask me, like, how did you learn how to do this? You know, it's a little difficult telling them, well, you know, you know, daddy was a piece of crap back in the day. So I had to do this to survive. You know, <laughs> daddy was struggling with life. And this is how daddy escaped his issues and his problems, you know. And even like my wife wants to go camping. And it was like just last night we were talking about it. And today, you know, I told her, I was like, you know, there, there's this thing that I do when I'm, I'm laying down. And sometimes I'll just put my hand up when I'm laying down, I'll just leave it in the air. And they're always like, why do you do that? I'm like, it's just a habit. And so my daughter asked me, she's like, why do you do that, dad? Like you're always doing it when you lay down and you just put your hand up in the air. And I was sitting there remembering. And I was like, man, when I was camping in the woods, I had, I would dig down to the thermofrost at the bottom, put some cardboard boxes and two blankets and you're good to go. Get a nice little tent from REI and you're straight. But I used to have this hole because right above where I, used to, I was, I was uh, camping at, it was these trees that would wrestle on it. But sometimes if they would fall down, you'd have to push it back up. So I would sleep with my hand up through the hole in this tent at the very ceiling, holding these branches up, but I would also hold it up because I wanted to know the temperature outside. If it was cold, if it was breezy, you know, sometimes when you're going from like negative one and the temperature changes to like 21 degrees, that change, you feel that warmth. But I've done it for so long that now it's just one of those things that I do when I'm laying down. But then I was thinking about it and I was like, man, that's probably the reason why I never want to go camping. Like I don't, my wife wants to go out like, hey, let's go and enjoy nature. And I'm like, no, I've seen, I've seen enough of that. When, you know, when the aurora borealis is your ceiling, is your, is your entertainment, you know, you kind of can't yeah. take that away. But at the same time, when you're doing that because you have no other choice, mm -hmm. you know, it just brings up brings up really, really uh, traumatic times that I just choose not to want to live through again. Yeah, of course. 
tell her, I want to save up money and we'll go to a five-star hotel with a nice spa oh, and a nice man. pool. <laughs> you know, that's why anytime we go somewhere, I make sure. I'm like, when well, we stay at a hotel, I got upgrade points. I'm, I'm a platinum member with Marriott. You know, <laughs> like, I, those are the things where I'm like, ah, this is nice. Like, we can stay somewhere. We don't have to be outside. But at the same time, if we had to, I know I could jump right back into it because there are things that even no matter how successful and how much my life, my quality of life increases, there are things that I've been through that they're just a part of me and I'm never gonna be able to change that. Yeah. And I think, as you say, you've had multiple trauma and you know, it's like a big boulder when you carry it around with you, but you've been able to chip away and make it smaller to be able to, to move, move forward, isn't it? Yeah. So have you got any experiences that really stand out for you when you were homeless, uh, whether they be funny or really sad or anything you could share with us that maybe we wouldn't normally um, think yeah, of? I, I, I have a lot of funny stories because I, I have a lot of great people in my life. A lot of people that supported me and were very good to me. To this day, I can call them up and you know we can share good stories but the, probably the memories that stick out the most were the friends that I've lost and the, the tragedies that you are privy to when you're in that world, right? Um, you know, the, the, the native culture there, they're so awesome, like a brilliant, beautiful culture. But a lot of times you see the worst of it when alcohol is involved and, and trafficking is involved and abuse and they're very old you know, a lot of times if they're coming from these tribal cities and communities you know that are a little bit out there they're in the middle of nowhere and then they come to the city you know it's kind of like that it reminds me of me going to the military thinking that i'm about to escape and live this life and then you get lost in the chaos of the the nightlife and you know i've seen so many friends just pass away from alcoholism passing out in the winter time in the snow and you're, you're, you're not being found until the snow melts or you know I've, I've had a friend that I was telling you about when they found her underneath a bench and she was trafficked you know and they just did the horrible things that that, that take place yeah they're just they're, they're just people that are never going to be back in your life ever again so you know it's 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 a difficult difficult thing to have to have on your mind but it also makes you very aware of those people and then who they are those negative people that are the reasons for that and, and you get to see them up close and personal and you get to just get that feeling for them you know sometimes there's a smell that a person has no matter how much they clean that will always be on them that lets you know what kind of person they are or there's that mannerisms or the way they say things or how they manipulate, like those are, it, they're triggers for you. You know, you perk up and you get aware and, and your heart races and you start sweating out of nowhere. And, and then you remember your friend that you lost. And this was the last person that this type of person was the last person you saw them with, you know, and they went to a hotel to have a drink and you never seen them again. So wow. there's a lot of, uh, red flags that I've taken away from my experience, but it also gives you an awareness of life, a self-awareness and a social awareness that I'm able to pass on to my kids yeah. and, you know, and to bring into awareness and bring a light that these are the dangers that are out there. When you see this run, when you, when you get that feeling, don't ignore it, pay attention and go. And because of those experiences, I mean, it really builds a tough skin. And it's allowed me now to, to really stand my ground when it comes to how individuals are. And if I don't like something, a lot of times people will be polite and they'll, they will swallow their own uncomfortableness to not make somebody else feel uncomfortable. I don't care about any of that. You ain't paying my bills. You ain't living my life. Yes. You're not me. If I don't want you in it, if I got something to say, we're about to have this. Like, I don't like confrontation, but I always get a mouthpiece ready to put in and go to work. Yes. I'll step into the ring any day with it. You've got a real firm sort of healthy boundary and, and a lot of us, you know, we, we do try and be polite and but like from what you've been through, you've got to have that. And what you were saying, everything there, I mean, for, for those of us 
people might not realize when Kenny says trafficking, he's mean, he means human trafficking, sexual exploitation, sex trafficking, which is even happening in our city today in Swansea. And, um, you know, it even happens in America where it, it's not even necessarily from different countries. You know, it can be from, and it's happening here from city to city. And it, yeah. it, it's, that's what people think, isn't it? People imagine, like in the UK, they think maybe, Slo you know, Western Europe, Slovakia, Slovenia, coming over, Romania, whatever. But it's not, it's like British people are being taken from, say, Manchester, Liverpool. They, they're being brought to Wales and they have no idea. And it just takes one woman to meet one man who pretends to be her boyfriend and everything and wonderful. And he can inject heroin into her when she's sleeping. And next thing you know, She's addicted, and it can happen that easily to every single one of yeah. us. It, it, that's so funny you say that. Like, I, I have seen that more often than you would know. Like, all it takes is a person to just be pricked with a little bit of something. Yeah. And then they get sick, and then somebody helps them feel better. Yeah. yeah. And then next thing you know, they're roped in, and they're gone. That's yeah. it. You know, and where I live now in El Paso, our, our sister city, our twin city is, is in Ciudad Juarez, right? It's Mexico's literally uh, right next door. Oh, wow. And when we were kids, man, we used to go there all the time to party, man. Like, it was nothing. You don't think twice about it. But we were going through a time where the cartel, the violence was coming across the border. And then people were taken back across the border. Or if you go there, you would hear people disappearing, you know, and it's very prevalent. Like that hasn't changed at all. The only thing that's changed was how they do it. You know, evolution happens on the worst and the best of times. And unfortunately, when it comes to trafficking and, and the age of the internet, all of this, my life happened right on the cusp of the internet becoming a big thing, but it, I'm talking about, we're still in dialogue when I was going through all of this, you know, yeah. <laughs> Tinder wasn't around, my space wasn't the space to be in, and, <clears throat> you know, so having that access was barely becoming an issue, but then, you know, I look at it nowadays, and I, I, and I worry, and, you know, and if I may, I'm going to segment it to, to something that, for my homeless, that affected me so much today, was dealing with my, 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 uh, internal family issues where I had a problem with my daughter and eventually she had ran away and it happened right under my nose you know one day you know my daughter was she was going through her own issues she's going through her own like that that inherited mental issues that people don't think is genetics but it is and she was experiencing the same thing I was going through but I didn't know how to deal with deal with it I was barely dealing with my own and now I have to deal with my daughter and this is a little bit after her attempted suicide at 12 years old, where she tried to take her own life at school. And now we're dealing with this. We're, we're dealing with this, this difficult time at home. And, you know, I started working from home so I could be around her. And I'm in a meeting. And I heard the door close. And I didn't think nothing of it. You know, I'm thinking she's going to crash or something. And, and when it happened, I had about 15 to 30 minutes left in my meeting. When I get done, I go out, I'm looking for her in the house. Couldn't find her. Look around again, couldn't find her. Look around again, couldn't find her. Go outside, look around, couldn't find her. An hour into it, I'm a mess. I'm a hot mess. I can't find my daughter anywhere. She's gone. Finally call the police. Police officer shows up and I'm trying to hold my own. You know, like I have to be a strong dad. I'm a man. Men don't show their feelings like that. You gotta be the one that's there. My wife is already a mess, her stepmom. And this is where the cop is like, well, we need to make sure we're getting all the borders because the first thing a teenager does when they run away is they try to leave the city. And I'm thinking like, that ain't my daughter. She's not leaving. She's not, she's not gonna leave. You're like she's around here somewhere. Call her mom, told her mom what's going on. And her mom had moved to El Paso a little bit a couple of years before, so her mom is worried and everything, and we're doing our best, relying on the police to find her. And it didn't hit me until the sun started to go down. And as it got closer to the horizon, all of my fears that I remember from being homeless myself created a new anxiety 
because it wasn't just me where I'm a man and I'm an adult and I can take care of myself. And if something happened to me, there's a better chance. And I'm thinking of all of this is for a tiny three foot two, you know, not even a hundred pound little girl lost in a city that's next to the border. So oh, the stature. Oh, and, I, and I remember when it became dark, I broke. Like I couldn't handle it. So as I'm about to pick up the phone to call my parents and I called them, I told them what happened. And I was really holding off posting it on Facebook because I didn't want, I didn't want everybody in my business, but right when I was about to post it on Facebook, I got a ping that she turned her phone on. Oh I knew her God. location. And it was, it was on the other side of town at a house. And I drove like a bat out of hell called up my best friend. And by this time, there was no holding back emotions. I'm, I'm bawling to my, my best friend, like, yo, Kennedy ran away. We got to go find out. We got to go do this. I, 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 bro, I need you meet me at this address. This is where I'm going to be at. Pull up the address and it's a house. And I'm just looking. And in my mind, I'm every shadow that moved, every flicker of a, of a blind, everything was her calling for help for me. My mind was telling me that's her. And finally, you know, the cop, I called the cops. They came there at the house and they're like, yeah, we got a report that some girl was going door to door trying to sell her art. And now my heart dropped even more because that's my daughter. She draws. Oh, and oh she my God. doors trying to make money. And I'm like, this person got her. Like they're solidifying all of my fears. And I'm doing everything to not burst through this person's window, break everything and rescue my daughter. So we started driving around the neighborhood, but I'm focused on this house. The cops are looking. And then next thing I know, I get another ping and she's in the area. So we call the homeless shelter, the runaway shelter. And they said, oh yeah, your daughter, she did call us and she wants us to go pick her up. And I'm like, hey, tell me where she's at. They're like, well, we can't because she says she's afraid of you. Broke me. My daughter's afraid of Afraid of you. Broke me. I'm like, you need to tell me where she's at. And, and right when I was going to be like, fine, just pick her up just so I can know she's safe and take her to the homeless shelter. The police officer grabs my phone. He's like, hey, this is officer so-and-so. You need to tell me where this child is at right now or I'm going to you know, hold you for you know, um, getting in between us rescuing this child. They're like, okay, well, she called us from this gas station. The gas station that I was standing in that parking lot of that gas station. Oh my gosh. Turn around. She's in the gas station window, right there, right in front of me. I just, right there. Oh, Jeff. And the cops go in and talk to her. They want to make sure she's okay, which I get. And she comes out and I want to be angry. I want to be firm. All I can do is I'm a huge teddy bear. I'm, I'm <laughs> bawling, just holding her. She's okay. So as I'm talking to the cops, my friends, they walk her back to my truck and I go to them and they're like, hey, Candy, before you get in the car, I just need you to understand, listen to your daughter. No matter what she says, just listen. And I'm like, what are you guys talking about? Like, come on, get out the way. Let me see my daughter. My friend is like, oh, man, we're walking to the car. And she's like, yeah, I know you guys are worried about me. I have the tendency of making my dad cry. And it was at that point I realized that she was on survival mode the same way I was on survival mode. And I'm trying to talk to her like a parent. I'm trying to tell her all the things I think a parent should tell her. But all she needed was the Kenny who went through that exact same thing and how I got over it. And from there, we started a whole new journey of understanding mental illness, resources that are available, resources that suck, that don't work, avenues that you can take, what it means to be coping, how to be humble when your child is telling you they hate you and all of their problems are caused by you. And all you've done their entire life was rescue them from the dangers that their other parent put them in. And these are the things that came with being a parent of a child with mental illness who attempted suicide, who ran away. And it also opened my eyes in how I was able to learn how to deal with my own mental pain, my own mental illness, because 
if I'm going to expect her to become better, I have to become better myself. If I'm going to expect to be an influence on her mom, who at the time was struggling with her own drug addictions, that drastically affected the course of my daughter's growing up. Because during all of this time, her mom was doing drugs. She was with her in Alaska, and I was in Texas getting better, which goes back to the reason I left because I could be a better man. I left her with this situation going on. So how shitty was my life that a drug riddled lifestyle was better for her than what I was giving her? Pain upon pain upon pain. Yeah. The realizations that you've had and the ownership, when I say being humble is a different definition when you're learning how to become a better man, you've got to own all the crap that you've done and your part in it. And, and also recognize what's not your fault and you don't carry burdens. And yeah. so that's kind of how being homeless transformed that experience of my daughter running away to a whole new level of this is where we need to start and this is how we're going to start together. Yeah. Whoa, what another part of the tale. Wow, I mean, so much there. So um, obviously what was must have been, what it, well, as a parent, what... You know, you worry that she's in that. You're thinking that she's in that house. You'd be worrying that you know these um, pedophiles or something have got her. Like that, she's going to be trafficked. Oh my gosh, your mind must have just been like, I can't even imagine. So today, now, how's your relationship with your daughter? Where is she living now? Is she back with the mum? Has the mum got help? Oh no, I got full custody. Her mom has visitation. Oh. Her mom is doing better. Her mom is on her own path of recovery. To which. I 1000% support and you know even we've had a very civil relationship where you know it's allowed me to help other parents going through custodial battles how to help them be civil and understand what you should and shouldn't be doing um, but there's one thing that I just I love the most about everything that, that happened was when I get upset and I get mad at her I can't be too mad because she's here for me to be mad at you know, she, she's here for me to find her and, and, and hug her. Oh. Just to tell her how much I love her. You know, it's just, so just, to, just, it also helps me like ground myself to know that she's still struggling and she's going through a lot of the stuff that I went through as a kid, but we we came from a culture to where you don't talk about these things. You don't deal with them. You know, in the nineties, you were a kid that just was acting out when you had these problems. But now I can look at her and I, I'm still tough and I'm still firm. You know, some things won't waver, but my approach is always at the end of the day, I'm just happy you're here for me to be mad at you. You know, I don't want to curse a grave. I don't want to wonder what if, who you could have been. You know, it's been three years since that. And she has grown into such a beautiful young woman, but it took a lot of pain. Like, her life was such a hard life for her and and I had to recognize what I couldn't control and what I can but now what I can do is offer her insight I can't expect her to follow it because I sure as hell didn't follow my parents advice right <laughs> but I can offer her insight and build a relationship so that no matter what happens down that road she won't be afraid to pick up the phone and call me the way I was afraid to pick up the phone and call my parents because we didn't have that relationship and I was afraid. Yeah. I want her to be able to say, no matter what happens, dad, I can call you and let you know. It was like last night we were at Walmart and it, it sucks that I still have these anxieties. So she's like, we're walking. She's like, dad, I really gotta use the bathroom. Can I just go? And I'm like, no, stay with me. I don't, I don't trust people in Walmart, you know? And she was like, no. Yeah, I got to go. All right, cool. Go. <laughs> yeah, meet me, at, meet me at the checkout. And so I'm done. I check out. She's not out. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. She's not out. And I'm already panicking. Like, did she decide to run away again? Did somebody oh, have Did someone take her? Yeah. Has she been talking to her friends? And they're meeting up. Like, I'm panicking. So I call her. And she's like, Dad, I'm in the bathroom still. But it's that time of the month. And I don't have anything for me. Oh, and I was like, girl, like you, you need to tell me these things. So I go down the aisle, I get her her supplies. I, I asked one of the, the workers, I was like, excuse me, 
sorry, my daughter needs this. She's in the bathroom. Can you please give this to her? Oh, bless you. Know? <laughs> and then she comes out and she's like kind of red in the face. I'm like, what's up? She's like, thanks for doing that, dad. I, I didn't want to ask you. Come to find out, she's like calling my wife, like blowing oh, her up. Bless <laughs> her. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, I'm here, like tell me. She's like, yeah, I was just embarrassed. But you know, so now she knows that my dad is not embarrassed to do this for me. He yeah. got my back. And it's because of those situations that I want to build upon, but it's still like, I still have that worry and we still have a long road to build, but it's still an option for us to have that because she's here. Yeah, that's wonderful. But I'm so happy for you. Looking at the time, Kenny, my gosh, there's nine minutes left. We need to go now, zoom forward to what you're doing now, how you're helping others. You've got your mm -hmm. t-shirt. Yes, how, yes, how rise in family. So because of all of these things that I've gone through, um, I, I was able to, during the height of the pandemic, start an organization called Rise Enterprise. It stands for Realize Important Surpass Expectations, where the goal is to help you keep your self-talk strong. We are here to teach emotional intelligence, to help you be self-aware, to be socially aware, practice empathy, relationship management, or, and situational management. It goes both for professional organizations that help uh, teachers, educators, and advocates for at-risk youth, young adults, and parents, teens of all. And then I work individually with homeschooling to help those parents who not only have affected by the pandemic, but taking their kids out of the school system because they felt it was flawed, but to still give them an, a, a place for their children, their teens, their young adults, and themselves to be confident in the transitions of tomorrow. But the most important part about it is, is teaching everybody how to be in the present. Teenagers are at that stage where they're worried about their future. Young adults and adults are worried about the things that have already happened and how it's affecting them today, but they're not living in the moment of this is where I am. How can the things that have happened or the things I want to happen be impacted by who I am today? And that's where a lot of my teachings come in is to find who you are, learn your story, build upon it and share with somebody else so you can continue to make the impact that you felt on yourself for somebody else. Yes. And Kenny, I have seen some of your videos. So Kenny works with at-risk youth. So that's youth maybe have come from care, they're vulnerable. And he is inspired. He does a special type of poetry. It's really cool. And he has um, got these videos, these young people who were telling their stories of their survival to triumph, like what we're doing now, um, but in a, in a poetry manner. So is that called Rise Enterprise on YouTube or what? how do they find that on YouTube? Uh, they can find, uh, it's called you know, Rise Enterprise on uh, the, inter the YouTube page, but the program that you're talking about specifically is called Finding Your Voice. So I it's know. where I, I teach them, well, I should say I guide them because I don't teach what they already have inside them. I just guide them to structure it in a way that allows them to present, um, you know, being a, a Toastmaster to a shout out to all of my Toastmaster family. Like they definitely helped me learn how to cater what I'm saying to my audience. And I just turn around and I presented it in a very small fashion. This is your story. Here's how you fill in the blanks. And now that you fill in the blanks, let's hear what you have to say. And every single time, there has been one story to where I'm like, that could have been better. You could work on that. Every one of them has brought tears to my eyes, wow. those of individuals, and we connect them with leaders of the community who give them feedback as well as opportunity to join their workforce. Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. Wow, I'm blown away by this episode, Kenny. Like, I wish we had, like, we, we could probably stretch this out over, like, four or five hours, but we've had to, like, condense it down into an hour. I've really enjoyed having you on. Thank you so much. We've got five minutes left. And at the end of every episode, I ask, I ask people for the guests for a uh, golden nugget of wisdom. So if you've got somebody, for example, um, it could be male or female. <coughs> say you've got a man and mm. he's suffering with mental health at the moment and he is trying to mask it and be the, the big man. And maybe he's having a, Maybe he's watching tonight. Maybe he's having a couple of drinks because to help him um, just kind of mask his pain. What would you say to someone like that or someone who's been in the military and maybe he's got PTSD or what would you say to those people? What to do? How to, how to get help? Feed the right wolf. 
inside of us, we have two wolves. And I'm sure everybody's heard the story of the two wolves. You have the wolf that's of good, that's love and compassion and healing and humbleness. And you have the wolf of evil, hate, self-loathing, so on and so forth. And they're both always an internal battle. That's the voice in your head that tells you you're your worst enemy, your best friend. When you feed the wolf of evil, which is the one that takes you down the path of masking your pain, that's exactly what you're going to do. You're not healing, you're masking. When you go through the path of humbleness and recognition and loving yourself, you're owning your mental health because it's a part of you and you will grow when you're able to own it. But it's up to you to feed the right wolf. Yeah, that's fantastic. And just for anybody um, in the UK, in Swansea, there's um, a charity around the UK, but we've got one in Swansea, it's called Mind, M-I-N-D, and you can go on their website for mental health advice. Obviously, we do advise as well. First port of call is your GP, which is your general practitioner, your doctor. I think in America, the same thing, your physician. Um, and go and see them and talk about it. There is absolutely no shame in getting counselling, support, life coaching, um, therapeutic talking therapy. There is no shame in getting medication. Many people are frightened of medication. I've been on medication for depression, anxiety, um, you know, one in four people suffer with mental health. Um, that's in the UK. I assume America's pretty similar with, you know, the prevalence of it. And, you know, if there is help out there, reach out to somebody, go and see a doctor. It's all confidential. You know, you, nobody even has to know that you've been to a doctor or what medication you're on. You don't have to tell anybody that. And if you do go on medication, it can make you feel worse for four to six weeks. But after then, it'll help you and get on your way. But you know, it's your personal choice, but talking therapies is fantastic as well. I would recommend here in America, we have one NAMI, uh, NAMI.com. We have one in, it, they should have one in every uh, city. Uh, NAMI of El Paso is a great place that, that's against, um, that is a mental illness and awareness, as well as any place that it supports young. So big brothers, big sisters, um, the, the workforce here, we have the Texas workforce. And then of course, you know, your local doctors, sometimes 911, pick up the phone and you call them your, your suicide hotlines. And yeah. there's so many avenues. And when it comes to medication, just remember, less is more. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. Well, thank you, Kenny. It's been wonderful having you on. Um, stay in touch. It'd be nice to, to, uh, You've been in touch after this definitely and yeah have a lovely day it's evening here it's nearly nine o'clock in the night now so what time is it there oh we're approaching two o'clock yeah oh lovely so lunchtime so thank you so much for coming on your story's incredible you need to i don't know that needs to go into a film or something it's uh maybe you'll get poached one day and we'll see you on the big screen and somebody playing you in it's hollywood fine. <laughs> if I do, it's because of um, platforms like this, and I, I appreciate and thank you so much for your time. I hope to be back on again, as well as have you as a guest when my show kicks off as well. Thank you. I would be honoured, and I am honoured to have had you. So thank you so much, and yes, good night, everybody. Thank you all for listening. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs>